got to say, it feels a little bit like carrying the proverbial, proverbial coals to Newcastle to come to Oklahoma to talk about Woody Guthrie. <laughs> I'm assuming many of you know his story has become part of the great greater American narrative, or in Woody's case, it's more like a counter-narrative to that of the mainstream culture. I'm assuming you know about the bus Dust Bowl troubadour made his way from Okima, Oklahoma, over to Pampa, Texas, when the family fortunes in Okima went bad. And then on to Southern California, where in the, 19, in the 1930s, where with his words and his guitar, he championed the cause of farm workers, became a noted figure in the labor movement. Probably know about how he went to New York in the early 40s, teamed up with uh, Pete Seeger, our beloved and Pete Seeger, whom we lost this, this past year. Pete, Lee Hayes, Ronnie Gilbert, and others formed the Almanac Singers and continued to champion the cause and the rights of working class, hard hit people. And you may know about his travels up to the Pacific Northwest to support the building of the Grand Coulee Dam. We roll, roll on, Columbia, roll on. You may know of his stint in the United States Merchant Marine. Then as the 50s gave way to the 60s, his body very gradually, excruciatingly succumbed to Huntington's disease, same ailment that took his mother's life here in Oklahoma. They didn't know what she had when uh, Nora Bell Tanner Guthrie developed Huntington's disease. They took her to Norman in what was then called insane asylums, and that was where she that was where she passed away. Woody took that, got that same ailment from his mother and. Only 55 years old when he died, but he sure packed a lot into that little bit of, that, that, that rather short life. You may know his personal life was a troubled one at times. He, three marriages, fair amount of womanizing, no getting around that. A little too much alcohol. He can be tough on his friends. It's up to the point, Pete Seeger, good old Pete again, once said of Woody, I can't stand him winters around, but I miss him when he's gone. <laughs> And you certainly know this rough and tumble, wiry little guy with little use for what we call the social graces left an amazing legacy. He became the spiritual ancestor to generations that came after him. And his physical decline was to the point where he could barely speak. 1961, when he was visited by a 19-year-old young man who'd taken the name of Bob Dylan. But their encounter had kind of a passing of the torch from one generation to another and of course you know he's the author of this land is your land we'll be singing that a little bit here but that was only one of thousands I mean thousands of songs he jotted down tossed on the pile in his lifetime he did a recording of it but here again it was his old buddy Pete Seeger who picked it up and gave it the really widespread exposure if it hadn't been for Pete we probably wouldn't be singing it the way we are with all due respect to Mr. Francis Scott Key this land is my national anthem. <laughs> Two really fine biographies have been done on Woody Guthrie, a lot of research writing on his life, but there's a part of his life that hasn't gotten a whole lot of exposure, and that is he had a very deeply held religious and spiritual consciousness. It was bound up in his passion for social justice. And this was a part of Woody Guthrie's life I decided I was going to try to learn a little more about when I set out to write this Bring Your Own God, Spirituality of Woody Guthrie. Got a real surprise in the coffee hour between here when all the books just went. There's some more up at the Guthrie Center if you want to catch some up there. And so I got the idea for doing this. I contacted the Woody Guthrie Foundation archives by getting access to the material I figured I'd need. And they were located then at a place called Mount Kisco, New York, just a little ways above New York City. And I live in southern New Hampshire, so it was pretty easy for me to get from southern New Hampshire to Mount Kisco so I could do the work I needed to do. And Shortly after that, they, uh, all those archives, all of that material was relocated a few blocks north of here, up at the Woody Guthrie uh, Foundation Archives. And I'm glad they did that. I think it's in its proper place, but I've got to tell you, I'm glad I got my work done before they moved them out here. Uh, <laughs> I look, getting, getting to Tulsa from New Hampshire is a little, little, little bit more of a run than from, from southern New Hampshire. And when I told uh, Woody's daughter, Nora Guthrie, she's the one who runs the foundation there, I told her what I was interested in working on. She said, well, this is part of my father's life that's just sitting there waiting for somebody to pick up. A 
But what I learned as I delved into Woody's letters and journals and scribblings, a lot more material about his spirituality than I was able to pick up in the time I had given. So I feel what I was able to put into a book kind of gives an overview, a good introduction to this piece of Woody's life. There's a lot more left there for other people who want to keep working on this thing. So what I'm going to do here within the time limits of a sermon, offer a little sampling of what I found, what I wrote about. I'm going to jump right in the middle. Because of all the documents I went through, the most amazing one was that thing I read a little earlier when he wrote it to the woman who had become his second wife, Marjorie Mazia. As I said, he wrote it when he was on a ship, Merchant Marine, Second World War, 1944. Man, that letter took me about a whole day to read that thing. Letter is 23 pages, handwritten. Contains Woody's take on what we you use here called the interdependent web of life, and I call it the oneness letter. Now you may know this, the saw the slogan that he, he keeps saying one big union. Now one big union was the slogan for the industrial workers of the world, IWW, also known as the Wobblies. And Woody didn't take that away from its labor union setting. He just took the idea of one big union up to a more cosmic, spiritual kind of a level. A little bit again. As a general rule, any activity of your mind which tends to show us the real oneness of all things is great. The more a song shows us this oneness, the greater the song. This is the highest activity of your mind, this oneness. To see and feel this union is to see the relation, the connection between all objects and forces, and people and creatures. Now, Woody never uses the phrase interdependent web anywhere in this letter, but I still find it to be one of the best explications, if you will, of our seventh principle of any I've found. And one thing that became clear to me as I looked into the stuff was that Woody, he, he liked to give the impression of being kind of an, oh, shucks, what do I know, country bumpkin. But he was amazingly well self-educated. Never graduated high school after he relocated over to Pampa. But by his own account, he read about every book in the Pampa Library and focused on the ones on religion and philosophy. And while he kind of had this eclectic take on religion, he kind of liked them all. In fact, when he was back in the Merchant Marine, he was on the Merchant Marine ship, and this is in one of the stories about him. He got into a conversation about religion with some of his other shipmates there, and at some point in the conversation, he said, well, hell yes, I'm a religious man. I kind of like them all. <laughs> So even though he had that kind of universalistic idea, he was still had a real fascination with the person of Jesus. Now, his early years in Okima were nominally Protestant. He was not in a church-going family. But he developed a real strong identification with the man Jesus as his working-class hero. And he even wrote a song about it, which he just called the song, Jesus Christ. Interestingly enough, he set the tune to the ballad of Jesse James. <laughs> Part of it goes, Jesus Christ was a man who traveled through the land, hard-working man and brave. And he said to the rich, give your goods to the poor. And they laid Jesus Christ in his grave. When Jesus came to town, all the working folks around believed what he did say. But the bankers and the preachers, they nailed him on the cross. And they laid Jesus Christ in his grave. Well, Jesus, as you know, is a very kind of a shrouded figure and however accurate or not Woody's take on him may be, what he did was he looked to the central iconic figure of the religious culture in which he was raised here in Oklahoma and over in Texas. He looked to that to draw inspiration and strength for his own efforts on behalf of oppressed people, this image of Jesus. And then toward the end of his life, and I'll touch on this in a few minutes, uh, as the Huntington's disease slowly began to overtake him, Woody moved to a more kind of a mystical embrace of the person of Jesus. We'll take a look at that in a few minutes here. A couple other points I want to hit first. I said earlier, Woody was a deeply creative and loving and caring person who could be very tough also on his friends and his family. Well, I shared that line from Pete Seeger about not standing Woody when he's around and missing him when he's gone. His second wife, Marjorie, same vein, had this to say about her husband. She once said, I don't think it's possible to be a great artist and a great human being. <laughs> I might want to take slight issue with uh, Marjorie on that and say that Woody was a great human being. He just wasn't always a good human being. 
basically walked away from his first marriage to a woman he'd married in Pampa when he was 21. She was 16. Had three kids. She was left to raise them on her own. Second marriage to Marjorie didn't do a whole lot to rein in his occasional womanizing. And then he had this very brief, bizarre third marriage that ended in an annulment. And Marjorie actually came back to take care of him after that strange episode in his, uh, in his life. Real, he loved humanity but had a hard time with sometimes with the people who needed his love the most. I remember I read a biography of Gandhi where the same thing happened, where he was being called to task for neglecting his family. And Gandhi said, well, my family is the human race, and, which is all well and good, but he still had his own family to deal with. And Woody sort of had some of that same stuff going on, same stuff going on with him. Well, I deal with all that in a chapter I titled The Holy, H-O-L-Y, Holy Paradox, and I draw some parallels between Woody's life and that of another of my American heroes, Jack Kerouac. That's what I'm talking about up at the Guthrie Center a little, little later. For each of their lives and in many others like them, I cited Gandhi, and you could even cite the passage in the uh, things in the Gospel of Matthew where someone comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, your, your mother and your brothers are looking for you here. And, and they're your family. They need you. And Jesus replied, well, my family, who is my family? My family is those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Again, very good noble sentiments on the one hand, but he still had this family on the other. Woody, Gandhi, Jesus. Put him in good company anyway. <laughs> so in each of those lives like that, Woody, Jack Kerouac, Gandhi, you find this paradox of a person living a saintly life on the one hand with a broken side on the other. And Marjorie Guthrie did have a point about great artists not always being great or good human beings, and that's a topic that long interested me before I ever got into this book, and I'm not going to go any further with it now except just to read the conclusion to the chapter where I try to sort a little bit of that out. Woody felt a mystical link to the greater human family, even as he surely knew he was coming up short with the families that needed him the most. He loved deeply, while also struggling to show it for those who personally needed his love the most. Artistic creativity, more often than not, grows out of or as a response to emotional pain. How many of Woody's wonderful songs and poems grew out of a painful emotional and psychological and spiritual struggle he was having with the contradictions he found within himself? The sacred is so often found in the broken. The holy often hides in the shadow side of our lives. A song in our hymnal by Rick Maston about that. Morning star comes out at night. Without the dark, there can be no light. And if nothing's wrong, then nothing's right. So let it be a dance. That was a sacred dance of Woody Guthrie. I'm going to read those words of Rick's and apply them to Woody and Jack and other folks like that. I also think it's some words from Leonard Cohen. You probably know them. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The light gets in the broken side of our lives. So it was a joy, really, to uh, uncover that spiritual side of Woody's life, the ups and the downs. I love listening to some of his more religious and spiritual-oriented songs. A lot of songs he wrote, he never set them to music, he just wrote them. And then his Nora daughter found them and asked if other recording artists would be interested in getting them out. And one was Ellis Paul, wrote the forward to my book took a song called God's Promise and set it to music. A group called the Klezmatics recorded a song of Woody's he wrote called Holy Ground. Has the words in it, every spot on earth I traipse around, every place I walk is holy ground. This same group, incidentally, to the Klezmatics, they released a CD, released a CD called Woody Guthrie's Happy Joyous Hanukkah. <laughs> See, it's his second wife Marjorie was Jewish. And he wanted to honor that side of her, that part of his life, that part of his marriage. And so he wrote this whole host of Hanukkah songs. Again, never, never put them to music, never published them. So this other group picked them up and put them out there now. Songwriter, singer Slade Cleves set another one of Woody's songs to this, in this genre to music. Called it, This Morning I Am Born Again. So discovering all that was really enlightening. Uncover this piece of, of Woody's life. And there were some very heartbreaking things to read as well. 
dealt with the two great tragedies in Woody's life and the spiritual sustenance he sought to cope with them. February 1946, he and Marge were married now, and an electrical fire broke out in an apartment they had in Brooklyn, New York, and killed their four-year-old daughter, Kathy. And she was the love of Woody's life. He nicknamed her Stack of Bones. And by now, Woody was well known enough that these, all these letters of condolences poured in from friends as well as from total strangers, and Woody answered practically every single one of them. I spent a whole day just reading the letters that Woody wrote back to the people who had written to him, telling of how he and Marjorie were dealing with the loss of their beloved daughter. To Pete Seeger, he wrote, her four years were wild and full. She had the real spirit of a people's dancer and of a people's singer. And if I ever display any sign of either spirit, it will be because of what Kathy taught me with patience and pain during her trip here. And to a woman who was a stranger to him but had written to offer her sympathy and spiritual counsel, Woody responded, No matter what your faith may be, I want to tell you, you can get helpful thoughts, visions, and hopes from them. I'm a student of all faiths, seeing in them the general, same general spiritual ideas and feelings present in all, always living in the oneness of the human race with its blending and its mixtures of all colors and all kinds. I thank you again for thinking of me and my wife. Well, Winnie and Marjorie would have three more children. Arlo, I just saw last night, closed out the festival down there in Okima, where I've been for the past two or three days. He wrapped things up around midnight, and I still somehow got it, made it up here. <laughs> Arlo, Nora, whom I've already mentioned, and another son, Jody Ben, all three of them are in their 60s. They have blessedly not contracted Huntington's disease, which means they don't have it, because it would have shown by now. It was when they were all still quite young, though, that Woody would begin to experience the effects of Huntington's disease, which I say he inherited it from his mother and it died, she died undiagnosed, didn't know what it was then. Well, my final two chapters then deal with some of the letters, the journals, the notebook scribblings that Woody wrote between 1952 when he was first hospitalized to about 58, 59. After that, he couldn't hold a pen any longer. And you look at those documents and you can see 51, 52, he's still writing pretty plainly and he can use a typewriter. But as the years go by, the handwriting gets more and more scrawled to where it's almost hard to make out because he couldn't control, couldn't control his hands anymore. Taken all together, these writings would probably make up a book on themselves. He was in Brooklyn State Hospital and Grayson Hospital in New Jersey. And they even include a play. He wrote a play about one of the words he was on using the characters. It's called The Play Forsaken Bible. It reads a little bit like King Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, if you're familiar with that. And it was at this point in his life that Woody goes back to the person of Jesus. Now, he never forsakes, he never disavows those universal impulses of his, but his references to Jesus become increasingly pronounced and quite desperate at this point in his life. I would find whole pages of his journal where he just wrote the word Jesus over and over. Whole pages, well, Jesus, 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 just, just a whole page, just, just nothing but Jesus. And he's not writing so much about his working class hero, Jesus, now. He never, he never forsook that. But he's not writing about that so much now as he is a mystical kind of Jesus to whom he looks for some kind of deliverance. Just one selection from those writings from a poem he wrote in 54 called No Help Known. Huntington's Korea means no help known in the science of medicine for me and for all you Koreaites like me. Because all my good nurses and all my good medicine men and all my good attendees all look at me. And say by your words, by your looks, by your whispers, there's just not no hope, nor no treatments known to cure me of my dizzy career. Maybe Jesus can think up a cure of some kind. Words of Woody Guthrie as he knew his life was slipping away from him. As I said, by 1959, he could no longer write, but it will be another eight years before he died. Having one of those excruciating ways to go that I can, I can think of. Well, close things out a little more positive note here. I got to say, for the past four summers, this one included, I've traveled down to come out from my home in New Hampshire to go to Woody's hometown down in Okima, be a part of that Woody Guthrie Festival there. It's wonderful. They've been doing it, I think this was the 16th year. Now, his hometown didn't always embrace him <laughs> to the extent that it does now. In the years following his death, Okima wouldn't even acknowledge their native son. Wouldn't have anything to do with the festival in his name because of his alleged Communist Party ties. 
during his labor movement days back in the 30s and the 40s. Now, Woody wasn't a joiner of any kind. I don't think he ever joined any kind of an organization, let alone the Communist Party. He wrote for their newspaper, The Daily World. And his most definitive comment on that whole issue was to say, I ain't a communist necessarily, but I'm always in the red. <laughs> Well, times change. I got a kick out of the back cover of the program book for the first uh, Woody Fest I attended back in 2011. They put out this program book every year and all the business establishments around, and maybe even some up here put these ads in, which you need to do in order to help pay for the festival to happen. You put out this ad booklet. So there's this full page ad on the back of the 2011 Woody Fest said, making this land your land since 1904. The ad was placed by the Okima National Bank. I had to guess some sort of circle has come around when your hometown goes from scorning you as a communist to having its local bank place an ad in a program booklet for a festival in the name of Woody Guthrie. <laughs> well, as the late Kurt Vonnegut liked to say, so it goes. I'm going to close up here and, and we'll sing his best known song concluding paragraphs from the final chapter, which I titled, His Spirit Was Made for You and Me. The most intriguing four words I find in Woody's signature song are those that say a voice was chanting about how this land was made for you and me. It's easy enough to sing one's way right past the refrain in order to get to the more familiar, right past that reference to get to a more familiar refrain. But I'm stuck on it. What is this voice? Did Woody just need a few words to fill out a line, or was he going for something deeper? Whatever he may have meant, I take it to mean there is a reality, a voice, if you will, that is greater than ourselves and is continually calling us to our better and more holistic selves. Over the centuries, over the millennia of human existence, certain prophets, certain teachers, certain wise and brave men and women have caught this voice and they've attempted to bring its message to their fellow human beings in whatever time and place they were living. Some paid dearly for their efforts. Some lost their lives, heeding and sharing the voice. It was and is a voice that says the earth belongs to all of its creatures, that all are entitled to freely participate in the fullness of its life, because we're all bound up together in the life of this grand and mysterious universe in which we all live and move, have our being. Woody Guthrie knew that voice well. He shared with us what he could of that voice in the time he was given. For that we say God bless him.